I am, uh, <laughs> I'm late to this review. I've had the RSL Speedwolfer 12, or I had it, about two months ago. I tested it, brought it in the house, listened to it for a period of like a, two weeks, I think. Then I went and tested it outdoors. And now I'm getting around to publishing a review for it. The thing is that there's so many other reviews already where people have given their subjective opinion and or data. If you look at audioholics.com, James Larson, who is the resonant measurement and review guy there, has tested and given subjective thoughts about this subwoofer. James Larson is, in my opinion, he's probably the go-to subwoofer tester guy in the hobby today. He does a better job than I do. I have no problem admitting that. Tip my hat to Mr. Larson. So if you're interested in looking at another person's opinion and data, check out audioholics.com. Also, Joe and Tail, Nemo Propaganda, and the list goes on and on for other reviewers who have talked about the subwoofer. So that's why I say I don't really know what else I can say about the subwoofer that hasn't already been said, but yet I've had people request me to test the subwoofer, so here we are. The data that I'm about to walk through is all on my website, but let me just kind of give you the quick 411. All right, so my thing about subwoofers is I need SPL. And actually, it's kind of interesting. I listened to a podcast recently, and I think it was with SVS, and they basically said SPL is what matters for subwoofers. And I'm not saying that that's the only thing they said, but I listened to that and I thought, you know what, guys, I am right there with you. We can talk about all these other things all day long, but it's so frequency dependent that that's what you're hearing. You take a subwoofer and you put it in one room and then you put it in another room, you're going to have a different subjective impression. You're going to say, oh, this was super tight, punchy, fast, clean, whatever. Put it in another room where there's a modal issue at a, at a particular frequency that you don't like, and all of a sudden it's muddy, it's bloated, and, and it's slow. You have those subjective terms to describe the performance. But objective data, when you take the subwoofer out of the room and you measure it, then you can say, all right, now I know what the subwoofer is actually doing and the rest is the room. So if the subwoofer rolls off at 63 hertz, it's not a subwoofer anymore, it's a mid-bass driver. And it's very possible that you're gonna think that it sounds fast, quick, and tight because there's no additional bass on the low end to provide any bloat via the room. Now, if you had the subwoofer and it extends all the way down to 20 hertz, dude, you're going to hear a lot of bloat. You're going to hear ringing. You're going to hear all sorts of things. And it's going to be because most likely of the room. And you're going to need equalization. You're going to need multiple subs to figure that issue out. The only way that you're going to know if it actually is the subwoofer is to test it objectively, anechoically, outside of a room, outdoors, free space. And then if you see that the subwoofer has a very strong resonant peak around 50 hertz, and then it tapers off immediately, well, you know that there's something wrong with the design and it might actually sound tight, punchy. And you may use the term accurate because I see a lot of people correlate accuracy with tight or punchy, but that's not the case. Accuracy really just means how true is it to the signal that's provided. So if I provide the subwoofer with a 30 hertz signal and it doesn't produce it, it's not really accurate anymore. Now, if it's not designed to go down to 30 hertz, that's one thing. If I provide it with a 50 hertz signal at let's say a reference of zero decibels, or let's just make up a number at 90 decibels. And it actually provides it at 96 decibels because it's got a strong kink because the enclosure is way too small, then that's no longer accurate. But I wanna say all of that because it really is important to understand when you listen to somebody talk about a subwoofer's performance, you're listening to them talk about the performance of the subwoofer in their room and where it was located. They can move it three feet out from the wall, completely different sound. So you've got to have data to understand what the subwoofer is actually doing. And this kind of goes to the same thing about speakers in a room, but there is a little bit of difference. I'm not gonna get into that here. Schroeder frequency, Google it, you'll see what I mean. So with that said, I'm gonna walk through some of the data that I've captured, I'm gonna hit the highlights, and then I will leave it up to you to decide what you want to do, okay? All of the data you're about to see is actually posted on my website. I do have a website, it's aaronsaudiocorner.com. Some of you didn't know that until now. <laughs> In terms of frequency response, this speaker has a few different contours. It has four different modes, reference, movie, 
music, and boundary. Reference is basically the stock profile that most people are probably gonna go after because it gives you a more neutral response. And you can see that in blue, and by the way, these are all 84 decibels, roughly full anechoic outdoor measurements, reference to one meter SPL, okay? Just FYI. Uh, from about, let's say 100 Hertz to about 30 Hertz, it's pretty much flat. And then at 20 Hertz, you're about 76 to, what is that, 84? Let's say you're about six decibels down at 20 Hertz. That's kind of give or take. You might be able to eke out a little bit of a better definition in here. That's 84 to 77. So yeah, let's just say about six decibels or so on average. With the movie mode, what you do is you get a little bit of a bump right around 30 hertz. And it's it's about plus or minus, well, maybe about plus two decibels, centered roughly around 30 hertz. So that's going to give you more of a rumble effect. And that makes sense because it's movie mode. For the music mode, what you wind up having in this yellow is a little bit of a bump of around one to one and a half decibels, centered roughly around 45 hertz, and it spans from about 30 hertz to 60 hertz. So what that would give you realistically is a little bit more punch. A kick drum is gonna have more fundamentals at around 50 hertz, you know, give or take, depending on the actual instrument. So if you want a little bit more punch, then you would wanna put it maybe into music mode. And music mode does roll off a little bit earlier than the reference mode. And compared to the movie mode, actually it has a little bit more extension on the very low end, but basically what you're getting out of music mode is a little bit more 50 hertz punch Movie mode, you're getting a little bit more 30 hertz rumble. Now in boundary mode, you can see in this red right here, it rolls off at around 40 hertz. And you think, why would anybody put it in a boundary mode? In a boundary mode, what they expect is that when you put it next to a wall, that wall is gonna reinforce the bass. So you're gonna have more low frequency bass when you put it next to a wall. So if you want to help attenuate some of that additional low frequency bass, let's say you live in an apartment or a condo, and you don't want that low bass traveling through the walls into your neighbor's area, then you would put it into boundary mode. What I'm providing here is the SPL at three different levels, 0.01 volt input, 0.1 volt input, and then max SPL is at about two, two and a half volt input. And we can see that my target SPL for each of these, going in that order, is around 64 decibels for the lowest, around 84 decibels for the medium output, and then around 100 decibels for max SPL. Again, this is full space. If you're comparing to somebody else who has provided ground plane data, then add six decibels to the max SPL, you'd be at about 106. The thing that I wanna look at here though is just what is the trend of the speaker doing? With smaller subwoofers, what you'll often see is that there is boosted low frequency at lower volume. And then as you turn the volume up, there's a limiter that allows protection for that subwoofer to not have over excursion and then it would destroy itself. So what happens then is that as you turn the volume up, the output on the low end is tapered more and more. So let's say for example, that at 30 Hertz at 65 decibels, that's where you're at. And it matches the mid band or the mid bass SPL. But if you turn it up 30 decibels, then you should be at 90 decibels on 30 Hertz but due to some limiting, maybe it's 80 decibels. So the easiest way to see that information is to do some just direct comparison overlay. That's what we have here. I've normalized the three responses you just saw, kept the colors the same, to around 84 decibels at 100 hertz. At max SPL, what happens to the response curve? Does it keep the same curve? Because that's what helps define dynamic range. If it keeps the same curve and doesn't change SPL per frequency, then it has higher dynamic range. Now on the highest output at max SPL at about 100 decibels full space, we actually find that we have about one and a half to two decibels rise around 40 Hertz compared to 84 decibels. But below 30 Hertz, there's about two decibels or so lower output again, at the highest output capability. What I'm saying here is that in terms of dynamic range, the frequency response at the varying output capabilities does change a little bit. It's not a lot, but below 30 Hertz, you're gonna lose about two decibels of dynamic range from 84 to 100 decibels. 
And then at around 40 hertz, you're actually gonna gain around two decibels of dynamic range, which really just means that you're gonna have a little bit more additional punch at around 40 hertz at max SPL, but you're gonna have less rumble or less low frequency bass at max SPL. This is the CEA 2010 results that I have for this subwoofer again, taken outside. And just to give you a comparison, so it kind of makes sense to you, it actually means something to you. What I've done is I provided a couple different subwoofers here. One is the Monolith 12 inch, which was about $1,200 or so when it came out. It's no longer for sale, but it's one I tested that had really good results. In blue mode is sealed and this red is ported. The Jamo C912, which is about 220 bucks, it's a 12 inch subwoofer, a really good budget subwoofer. And matter of fact, it's probably one of the better budget subwoofers in that maybe 200 to $300 range. That one's in yellow. And then the RSL Speedwoofer 12S at 799 is in black. And we can see that the RSL Speedwoofer 12S in terms of CEA data, it actually does better than the mono price subwoofers at 16 Hertz by a couple decibels, but let's look at 105, what is that, 104 decibels at 16 Hertz to the Jamo 78. I can't math in my head, what is that, 28 decibels or 26 decibels or so of difference in output capability? Yeah, the RSL's kicking that cheap Jamo's butt and it's actually hanging with the big boys that cost at the time about 12 or $1,300, I believe. So in terms of objective output data, the RSL certainly holds its own and there's no reason why you shouldn't consider it as a possible subwoofer for your situation. Now, having said all of that stuff about the performance of the subwoofer, I'll tell you that when I listened to it in my room, I initially corner loaded it. It was a little bit too boomy. The 30 Hertz to 20 Hertz was just a little bit too boomy. So I wound up moving it out from the wall about a foot and that kind of alleviated that. It put some issues in some other areas, but I took equalization and I just dropped it down a little bit around 45 Hertz, I think was a specific mode that I had. And listening to it in terms of output capability, I had really no issues. I don't really think that I ever wanted for more output other than just, you know, maybe wanting to tear my head off. Now this is a living room that I set this up in. Living room, I think dimensions are around 20 feet wide by about 15 feet deep, uh, eight foot ceilings. And that was adequate. It was it was more than adequate. If you have a home theater and you have a larger space to fill and you have maybe high sensitivity front mange or something, then yeah, you're probably going to get at least two of these subwoofers or you might want to step up to one of the big bad boys, 15 inch, 18 inch to get you that solid 10 hertz output capability. But I think for most people in a typical living room type setup, there's no reason not to get the RSL Speedwoofer 12, at least that I could see. The only caveat to that would be its size. If you look at budget oriented 12 inch subwoofers, they're a pretty good bit smaller than the RSL Speedwoofer 12. So it's kind of Hoffman's iron law. Do you want low frequency, a small box or sensitivity? Take away sensitivity and just flip in cost. And you're kind of, you're gonna to have to choose two. And in this case, you would gain output capability and cost. So those are your two pros right there, those two. What is the drawback? Well, it's the size. The size for this subwoofer is, is quite large. Now, compared to other subwoofers that do better numbers in terms of lower frequency response, they all are large as well, but they also typically cost more. So that does it for this review. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them in the comments section below. As I said, there's tons of people who have already reviewed this, but hopefully this additional data gives you an idea of what makes sense for you to buy or makes you feel better about the decision that you've already made. If you'd like to support this channel, please use my generic affiliate links in the comment section below. Uh, you just, whatever you wanna buy, it doesn't matter. From Crutchville to Amazon, doesn't matter. Or you can join me at patreon.com and I would very much appreciate that. I will talk to y'all later. Take care, peace.